And to continue this wonderful evening, it's my great pleasure to present to you now the Administrator of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Uh, as he was mentioned today many times, a great American hero and astronaut. Please welcome to our stage, Mr. Charles Bolton. I'm sorry Charles is leaving because when we get to Q&A, I was going to refer all the questions to him. Uh, so now you'll have to suffer through me, but I've got some of his other folk from JPL who are back here. Uh, we've got lots of experts in the room and we can answer your questions. A couple of rules, because I have rules, okay? I'm a Marine and I have rules. Rule number one, you can ask questions anytime. Uh, you know, if you're like me, and it doesn't have anything to do with age or maturity, I just can't remember things as long as I used to be able to do. So if you have a question, rather than forget it, just raise your hand, ask it. There is no script. Uh, I can always get back to my slides or whatever, so I'd like for you to ask the question whenever it comes up. Rule number two, and it is probably the most important rule, there is no dumb question. None. Zero. Uh, you can't possibly ask the question that as soon as it comes out of your mouth, somebody else in the room is going to say, shut. I was wondering that, but I just didn't have the courage to ask it. So there are no dumb questions. Just, just go ahead and ask them. I, I want to talk a little bit, and I'm going to try to talk very little before we get to formal questions and answers. I want to tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do at NASA. Uh, Charles mentioned, going back to your question, how do we get the public interest? Um, I watched Neil Armstrong land on the moon. Uh, I was, you know, I was sitting in front of a black and white TV. I was in flight school in a place called Meridian, Mississippi. I was a young Marine Corps second lieutenant, and uh, I sat there mesmerized watching. Uh, still at that time, never, never dreaming that I could be an astronaut. So uh, I, that was not my lifelong ambition. If you talk to people who have flown in space, I don't know whether it's 50, 50 or what, but you'll find that a, a large number of us never dreamed of doing what we have done. Uh, in my case, as I grew up, you know, I really liked math and science. I loved it. I loved taking things apart and tinkering. So I thought, at one time, I thought I wanted to be a doctor. I had a, a, an uncle who was a doctor, and I wanted to be like him. And then I decided I wanted to be an engineer. Uh, I even went so far as to, this is what happens, perspective. Young people, remember that word, perspective, okay? Perspective, perspective, perspective. Uh, it's important. Perspective is how do you look at things. What, what, how do you see them? The question over here was, you know, we want to put our perspective on whatever we're going to discover uh, frequently. And so in NASA, two things that are really important to us are diversity, uh, just not only race and gender, but diversity of culture, diversity of ideas. And, and recently I've started telling people diversity of perspective. Um, you know, when I, when I go into a meeting or something and we talk about this planet, and it doesn't make any difference what it is. I, it, it, appears, it, it occurs to me right away that uh, I am probably the one person sitting in the room who has a dramatically different perspective on this planet than anybody else in the meeting. And that's for one reason and one reason only. I have been privileged to leave the planet and look back on it. Um, so my perspective is a little bit different. I, I think I was always an environmentalist, but my perspective of this planet from being out in space looking back, seeing that thin blue line, and I'm going to show it to you on some of the slides I have. The thin blue line that is our atmosphere. Uh, boy, let me tell you, you take your thumb, close one eye, and put it up there when you're looking out the window, and it's gone. That's how thin our atmosphere is in relative terms. It just disappears when you put your thumb up there from the vantage point of space. So, uh, you know, I, I realize how, how important it is for us to preserve this planet in whatever way we think we would like to have it. I like it the way it is. We can make it better, but you know, let's not mess it up. So, so perspective is really important. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about who NASA is, what we do. Uh, but for the young people in here, which means all of us, <laughs> because my perspective at my age or my, my level of maturity is that youth is here and here. And so everybody in here is young. You weren't young, you wouldn't be here. So I offer this to everybody. How do you get to do, how do you get Charles's job? You wanted Charles's job, right? No, it is autograph. You just wanted his autograph? You didn't want his job? My What's your name? Ryan. Ryan, 
I'll, I'll let him know because he can relax now. He was worried. <laughs> he thought you wanted his job. But now, you can have his job. Yeah. But there's several things you have to do. You've got to study really hard. Yeah. You know, you've got to study really hard. And uh, people say, what do I need to study if I want to be an astronaut? Everything. But you've got to have math and science, a fundamental math and science background. I like to tell kids, you know, in the United States, study English. Make sure that you can read, write, express yourself effectively. Uh, if you can't explain to somebody in writing or in conversation what's on your mind, uh, it's going to be really hard to convince anybody of anything. And so one of the things that we look for when we select astronauts is uh, how comfortable are they in front of people? How well do they express their thoughts? Whether they're odd thoughts or not, you know, can they, can they tell a story? Can they express themselves? So that's very important. Second thing is work really hard. Now, what do I mean when I say work hard? I'm not talking about with a shovel or something like that. When you're thinking, you're working. And so when you're in the classroom, you should really focus on what's going on in the classroom. Are you an athlete? What's your name? Charlotte. Hmm? Charlotte. Charlotte. Are you an athlete? Kind of. Kind of. What do you play? What's your favorite sport? Basketball. Basketball. What's your favorite sport? Swimming. Swimming. You good? Yeah. I'll bet you you practice hard. <laughs> Does he practice really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. What's, your favorite, what's your favorite event? Freestyle. Freestyle. Just now, when you're in the pool, do you have a, do you have a coach? Mm. I have a swimming teacher. Swimming teacher, that's good. When you're in the pool, are you thinking about your math test? No. You're focused on swimming, and you're focused on your stroke. When you go play basketball, hopefully, if you're on the court and you want to be really good, the coach says what? You know, if you want to be any good, you got to practice all the time. The coach is saying, you've really got to work hard. So if you want to be a good scholar, when you're in the classroom, really focus on that. Work hard on it. When you're out doing other things, dancing, sports, anything else, really focus on that. That's what I mean when I say work hard. And then the most important lesson is don't be afraid of failure. Uh, I never dreamed of being an astronaut. Never in my wildest imagination. But my, the reason I think I felt that way, in spite of the, the fact that my mother and father, who were educators, told me and my brother all my life, you can do anything you want to do as long as you study hard and work hard. They didn't tell me the don't be afraid of failure part. They just said, you can do anything you want to do. And I knew I was a good student. I knew everything else. But I grew up in the segregated South in, in the United States. So when I grew up, there were certain things that young black kids didn't do. You know, there were no astronauts. That, that was out of the question. So my perspective was, that wasn't going to happen for me. So why waste your time dreaming about it? Why waste your time thinking you could do that? Uh, I was afraid of failure. I was afraid that if I raised my hand and said, hey, I want to be an astronaut, somebody would laugh me off the planet. I was a little kid, but I always wanted to play football. My father was my high school football coach when I got to high school. I always wanted to play football. And, and I was afraid to say that for a while because I was so small, I was so short. I fell in love with my now wife, uh, oh, probably when we were in elementary school. We grew up together. We've, kn we've known each other since we were three. And she was always this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful woman to me. But I was like this. She was like that. All the, all the boys liked her and everything. And she was just very attractive. And I, I didn't even want to go up and say hello because I was afraid she would reject me. So you can't be afraid of failure. If you're afraid of failure, you're going to miss a lot of opportunities in your life. So only three things I'll tell you. Can't do that. We have four directorates. We call them directorates in, uh, in NASA, and that's how we run everything. Uh, most of the work is done money-wise, not, not work-wise. Most of the work money-wise is done in the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate. We run the International Space Station. Back in the shuttle days, we ran a shuttle. Today, we're building the Space Launch System, a heavy enough launch vehicle. We're building a capsule that's going to take humans to deep space called Orion. And uh, keep watching, keep watching. Next fall, I mean like months from now, not years from now. Next fall, we're going to fly the first flight of Orion. Uh, it'll be uncrewed, but it's going to go two orbits of Earth. And we're going to get it out where it gets a lot of speed and a lot of energy. And then we're going to let it come back into the atmosphere. You know, it's going to land out in the Pacific Ocean somewhere. We want to make sure that it's robust enough that down the road, when we're ready to put humans in it, it can survive. It'll look very much like an Apollo module. 
It'll look very much like Dragon, uh, that SpaceX flies now. Uh, that's just when we started talking about doing planetary uh, exploration again with humans, it's physics and aerodynamics that dictates the, the shape. You know, I would love to have a, a plane that has wings on it that I can fly. They don't do well coming back at that much energy, so we're going to be in a capsule, so, so bear with us. But that's human exploration and mission operations. Um, we have a, an incredible legacy at NASA. Uh, Charles talked a little bit about it. NASA was created in 1958. It didn't always exist. So it's a relatively young organization in the United States. Had it not been for the Soviet Union flying Sputnik, a uh, little bitty satellite that flew overhead, and all of a sudden, Americans woke up and there was this <laughs> And it was a man-made satellite going overhead. We were in the middle of what was then called the Cold War. Uh, it scared the living stuff out of everybody in the United States because we were in this pitched battle with the Soviet Union. Both of us had uh, atomic weapons aimed at each other and the fact that they got into space meant they had the high ground. And so we had a young president by the name of, back, back then, before the very young president, John Kennedy, the president at the time was, was President Eisenhower, who was a retired Army general. And he said, okay, we've got to catch up. We've got to do something. And he established NASA, took an organization that had been dedicated to aeronautics, airplanes and things like that, and, and kind of un, unmanned rocket ships, and founded NASA. And, and we became interested in trying to develop the capability to get people into space. And then President John Kennedy came along and made a speech that everybody perspective again. Everyone, you talk about us wanting another planet to look like what we want it to look like. John Kennedy made a speech at, a, at Rice University in, in Houston, Texas, back in the beginning of the 60s, and he said, before this decade is out, we're going to send a man to the moon, and we're going to bring him safely back to Earth. And uh, I have friends who were in NASA at the time, and they, they were there in the stadium, and they said, he said that, and they went, is he crazy? <laughs> this was NASA, OK? This was NASA. And they, uh, they said, we're not sure that the president is all there. <laughs> and they went home that night, and they said they woke up the next morning, and they said, no, he is all there. What it is is he trusts us, and he believes in us, and he knows that if we put our minds to it, we can do this. And sure enough, within the decade, uh, we had done exactly what, what President Kennedy said. We had put a human on the moon, and we had brought them safely back to Earth. Not before we lost a crew, however, on Apollo 1, just in a test on the launch pad. So when I talk about don't be afraid of failure, uh, we do dangerous stuff. We do risky stuff. That's why most of us are, are, in, the, are in this business, because we're kind of risk takers, and we like excitement and everything. When you do that, then you put yourself at risk. And you have to be very smart in the way that you proceed so that you minimize that risk. But um, this is a picture of me a long time ago. I'm the guy in the uh, blue with you know, perspective. <laughs> My back it is uh, what looks like the ceiling. And I, I oriented this picture so that I would, in fact, be on the ceiling. But in space, because you're going around Earth so fast, 17,500 miles an hour in low Earth orbit, and gravity is overcome by the centrifugal force that just wants to break the string that, that we call gravity, and just wants to let you go <laughs> way out into the solar system. But because there is no gravity, there, there's no way for the human body to get itself oriented, no idea of what's up and down. Your balance mechanism, your inner ear just quits working. And so you learn, you adapt. Instead of us trying to adapt the space environment to us, we adapt to it. The human body takes a couple of days and boom, it just thinks it belongs there. And you don't need to know up and down sensually because you've got your eyes. And your eyes can tell you, OK, you, you learn how to read upside down. You learn how to read right and left. You can do anything. Uh, you can see some of the food is floating and doing stuff. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. Uh, this was a, I, I talk about international uh, cooperation all the time. This was my third flight in space. And it was the first time I actually commanded the space shuttle. The, the young man who's upside down with his feet in a stirrup, that's Dirk Vermont. He was the Alan Shepard of Belgium. He was the first Belgian to fly in space, a Belgian astronaut. Uh, the young lady is Dr. Kathy Sullivan. She's really upside down uh, in Earth terms. Kathy was the first American woman to walk in space. And, uh, and she is today 
the administrator of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, a sister agency of ours. So that's kind of you know what we do when we're up there. We do. A, people always ask, "What do you do? What What does an astronaut do?" We do lots of experiments, tons. Uh, and here you just see Franklin Chang Diaz, who all his life wanted to be an astronaut. Franklin and I are classmates. We, we interviewed together. We were selected in 1980 in the second group of space shuttle astronauts. We flew our first flight together. And we flew my last flight in space together. Franklin grew up in a place called San Jose, Costa Rica. And at the age of seven, he went to his dad. He said, I need to go to the United States. His dad said, well, what? He said, because I'm going to be an astronaut. And his father said, right. <laughs> you know, his dad was an engineer. He had friends in the United States and everything. He said, look, Franklin, you're seven years old. Get real. Go back to school. And then let's talk. You know, graduate from high school. And then we'll talk. Ten years later, Franklin graduates from high school. He goes back to his dad. He says, hey, it's time for me to go. His dad said, go where? He said, same place ten years ago. I'm going, I need to go to the United States because I'm going to be an astronaut. And his father finally just gave up. Called a friend of his in Connecticut, in Hartford, Connecticut. He said, hey, I have a son, Franklin. He's 17. Uh, he doesn't speak English, but he thinks he's going to be an astronaut. So i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give him a one-way ticket to the United States, send him to you. He'll have $50. <laughs> Humor him for as long as you can. And when you grow weary, just you know, put him on an airplane, send him back home, and I'll pay you. And so Franklin <coughs> came to the United States speaking no English. Uh, enrolled in the University of Connecticut, almost flunked out the first year just because he didn't understand the language. Uh, refused to get any help from anybody, taught himself English, went on to graduate with honors from the University of Connecticut, went to MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, earned a PhD, a doctorate in plasma physics, and today he is one of the world's foremost plasma physicists. Uh, Franklin has flown in space seven times. Uh, Franklin's the exact opposite of me. Uh, all his life, he had dreamed of being an astronaut, but he was determined. He was not afraid of failure. He even took his father on. So it can be done. You know, it, it just can. We're doing medical experiments there, and uh, we do a lot of stuff. Here's some. Charles mentioned Dawn. He didn't say it by name. The asteroid there is Vesta. Uh, Vesta was a pretty big asteroid. Not, not, a, not the biggest. But Dawn spent a year going around uh, Vesta looking at it. Found out it looked like it could have, at one time in its life, had tectonic activity. Uh, a lot of stuff that looks sort of planet-like things. Uh, we learned that because we orbited that, that, that asteroid for a year. Dawn is now speeding off on its way to another big asteroid called Sirius. And it'll take it a while to get there because it's using something called solar electric propulsion. And it just, just kind of pokes along. Takes a long time to get there, but it, but it doesn't use a lot of fuel like, like chemical rockets do. So it's on its way. Up above that is uh, it's an artist's conception of Orion. That's the way Orion will look when it goes to space and carries humans. Solar rays for power, a service module on the back where the astronauts will live. The big thing, that's, set, that's, uh, that's SLS, the Space Launch System. It's like the old Saturn V, only bigger. It'll be the biggest rocket we've ever built. We're starting with a, a smaller version of it, uh, about 70 metric tons, but that's what it can lift. And we're going to use that to send humans into deep space. So that's the human exploration uh, and operations mission director. Last thing they're doing is they are the organization that's making it possible for us to, to, to open space opportunities for commercial space, for industry. So in the United States, after we retired the space shuttle in, in July of 2011, we didn't have a way to get cargo and people into space. But we were in the process of developing a way to do that, not for NASA to provide access, but for American industry and industries around the world. So we had two, two companies competed among others. The two that won were Orbital Sciences from Dulles, Virginia, and a little company called SpaceX that nobody had ever heard of. A guy named Elon Musk, uh, an entrepreneur, real entrepreneur, uh, started the company. And Elon, his dream is to colonize Mars. That, that's the kind of guy that's their CEO and founder. But those two companies today provide cargo transportation to the International Space Station for us. When I talk about international collaboration, two totally different companies. SpaceX does everything in a place called Hawthorne, California. That's where their plan is. They build the rocket. They build the capsule. They do everything. The, uh, the other company, Orbital Sciences, they don't build very much of anything. They build a lot of satellites for other people but they have a Ukrainian rocket with Russian engines 
And their module that carries cargo is called Cygnus, built by the Europeans. So a, a very international collaboration. Uh, it meets the requirement, it's 51%, at least 51% owned by American, so it's an American company. But a lot of different ways to do it, and those are the two companies. What we're showing here, down on your left, uh, is the Dream Chaser. It's a winged vehicle. Uh, right now, there are at least three companies that have bids in to be the, the first company industry to carry humans to space. Um, you know, we're not going to do that anymore. Uh, that's Dream Chaser is a company called Sierra Nevada out of Colorado. SpaceX is trying to modify their Dragon module to make it human capable. And then the Boeing Corporation has something that they call the CST-100. C CST uh, that's a, a capsule, looks like a, a small Orion. So those are at least three companies that we know are bidding. Uh, there are probably more. But come next August, we're going to make an announcement of the company or companies we've selected and, and then we'll start taking humans to space again from America. Question up there. Well, Someone had to ask your first question. <laughs> sure. Um, is there anybody in NASA who gives any credibility at all to the idea of a space elevator? Yeah, I, probably there is. I'm not really sure. I'll ask some of the guys from JPL. I keep hearing about space elevators. I know nothing about them. Theoretically, I think people think it's feasible, but we're not working on anything right now to my knowledge. Uh, a, a couple of things that, that we're not doing right now, but that doesn't, it doesn't mean it can't work. You know, people, we, we work now with a company called Inspiration Mars. Well, that's, that's the name of their, their proposal. Again, a, an entrepreneur by the name of Dennis Tito came to us and said, look, I wanna do, uh, I wanna do, a, 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 I wanna do something dairy. I wanna put two human beings, preferably a man and a woman in a, in a capsule, and I want to launch them off to Mars and just let them do a free, free return. So they launch, they just fly around Mars and come back to Earth. About two or three years uh, in a can for all intents and purposes. You know, people, people ask me a lot of times, why didn't you just tell them, get out of here? You know, that's crazy. I said, because it's not crazy. You know, it may in fact work. If he wants to take the chance, uh, we will give him every bit of engineering expertise we have, the technology we have, and we'll help him do it. So I don't discount anything, but I don't, Neither of you know anything about the space elevator? Any credibility? Everybody's going to know. <laughs> but again, perspective, that's, you know, that's JPL and they're, and they're robotic guys and, you know, so. <laughs> I, I, I call this, uh, it, it is still commercial space. Uh, how many of you know about Virgin Airlines? Well, the owner of Virgin Airlines is Sir Richard Branson. Uh, a bit. Uh, Sir Richard Branson also owns Virgin, uh, what is it, Virgin Galactic, and it is a spacecraft company. This uh, is Spaceship Two, which will carry a crew of two and five passengers, and this is during one of their more recent uh, jet engine tests, rocket engine tests. They are scheduled to fly probably this summer, and if they're successful, they will be the first commercial company to take humans into space. Now, there's a suborbital. So they'll go up to the edge of, of space and then right back down. So it'll be maybe a 20 minute flight, uh, several minutes of weightlessness, but, but spaceship too. And, and I think that's really gonna work. Uh, we have the second director. The aeronautics mission director is tiny. Um, they get a very small amount of our money, but they do incredible stuff because they work on airplanes and things that go in and out of space they do the focus on, on aerodynamics and aeronautics. And here, they're working on a, uh, a vehicle called the X-51 that flew this year successfully. First time we actually had a hypersonic vehicle, uh, we worked with the Department of Defense and NASA. Question back there, what's your name? Lila. Lila, Lila has a question. I love your purple. That's my favorite color, royal purple. Uh, how much is it to get into space? How much is it to get into space? Too expensive. You mean dollars? Really expensive, and that's the problem. One of the, there are a lot of reasons that we have turned to industry, the commercial means to get to space. It costs too much. Uh, you know, it is thousands of dollars a pound right now. Uh, things that really you worry about when you want to go to space, weight is one of them. Size, yeah, but not as much as weight. So you either get little things to send them into space, or you get a big rocket, uh, and when we do it, it costs a certain amount. Uh, you know, that's what industry will do. A company like, like SpaceX comes along, they have, a totally different, they have a totally different business model. And so they are significantly cheaper, at least initially, 
right now than anybody else. So they've, they've revolutionized the market, to be quite honest. Everybody now is trying to get their costs down so that they can compete with the price of SpaceX. It is not going to get mar uh, markedly less expensive until you own a company and you figure out how to make it really, really, really cheap. You know, people think that, that we, can, we can make space flight cheap. Uh, it's relative. It, it's always going to be kind of expensive. Virgin Galactic, compared to $20 million that it costs somebody now to fly on a Soyuz, on a Russian rocket, to go to the International Space Station. Virgin Galactic, I think the price of a seat is 200000 or something like that. So in relative terms, that's pretty cheap. And it'll get cheaper as we go along. So that's aeronautics. Question given, here. given that you've been in space several times, would you like to go that way? Would I, oh, I would love to go that way. Now, I got to talk to my wife. Uh, <laughs> you know, and she, I was loving being in the space program before, and uh, she and my two kids, my two kids are grown now, but, but they came to me one day and they said, okay, how much fun do you want to have before you grow up? Uh, <laughs> that was the way they put it. My mother, who is no longer with us, she's looking down on us tonight, but my mom used to always call. She, she never, I never went to space when my mother wasn't there, you know, at the launch site and everything. And I would wake up in the morning or night or whatever we're supposed to go, and I would call her to see if she was okay, and I'd let her know I was okay. And every time I came back, she said, when are you going to, you know, get a real job? <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, I don't know. But I would do that. I really would. And I, I think it's really important that Virgin Galactic be successful. I think it's very, very, we've demonstrated now that industry can, in fact, carry cargo. So that's a huge hurdle. Uh, the next big hurdle is to demonstrate that private industry or you know, public industry, whatever you want to call it, because Boeing and Sierra Nevada are publicly traded companies in opposition to, C to SpaceX. That's a, a real private company. Uh, but we have to demonstrate that they can do it. I know they will. Because we can't explore and do lower orbit access. The next directorate, big one, and Charles Alachi talked a lot about it, so I won't talk very much, is our science mission directorate. SMD, science mission directorate, is subdivided into four other areas. And, and they're kind of represented by some of, the, some of the pictures you see there. The one on your top left is the sun. That's heliophysics. They study the science of the sun, trying to help us understand what's happening on that thing. You know, that's our star. It is a relatively small star compared to other stars in the universe. But it's the only one we got. And so we're trying to understand what it does. You can see it burping. I call it burping. Uh, it, it's a coronal mass ejection where it sends big bursts of energy out. And they go all over the place. The ones we worry about are the ones that head our way, that come this way. We get a, we get a pretty big one one of these days. Uh, in spite of the magnetosphere that protects us and everything else, uh, you can find that you, know, you, you turn on your television one day and it, it's not there. And it's just because. We've had a really big burst of energy from the sun that has knocked out satellites, knocked out all kinds of stuff. And I'm not talking about knocking them out of the sky, just electronically shorted them out or done something bad to them. Uh, the other area is, um, well, it's New Horizons is on its way to Pluto, the one just below that. That's planetary science. Uh, we have a separate Earth science division. People always say, why do you have a separate Earth science division? I said, because that's my favorite planet. I didn't do it. But it is my favorite planet, and it deserves a, a division of its own. So we have planetary science, uh, earth science, heliophysics, and then the one that, that is focused on two things that Charles talked about, called astrophysics. And astrophysics asks themselves, an astrophysicist comes to work every single day with two questions in mind. Who knows what they are? Yes. You answer my question first. What's your name? You play soccer? Football? You, you look like you're in a soccer game. No, that's not my question. I'm gonna, you ask me your question. <laughs> Go ahead. If one of the waves got too big, do you think they could damage Earth? If one of the, you mean the burst of energy yeah. from, they won't, her question was, if one of those bursts of energy is really big, would it damage Earth? Physically, it wouldn't hurt Earth, at least I don't think so. But what it would do <laughs> would be to knock out communications it might physically do something to a satellite, uh, you know, if it shorted it bad enough. Um, it, could, it could really just make the satellite useless forever. But, but it's not a threat to Earth the way that asteroids are. And I'll talk a little bit about asteroids in a little while. Asteroids are things. They're, I mean, it's not energy. It's a physical thing. And usually, there can be only one physical thing in one space at a time. Asteroids come at, asteroids come at Earth all the time. 
were it not for our magnetosphere and our really thick, relatively thick atmosphere, Earth would look like the moon. Uh, we have we have pictures of that come from you know from from the DOD from the, the military that keeps track of everything out there. And when you look at the asteroids that that bombard our atmosphere but don't get through to Earth, uh, we would look like the moon. That's how we're bombarded all the time, and most of them don't get through. But you didn't answer my question. <laughs> Two things that astrophysicists says that. Tell me your name one more time. Tasman. T Jasmine. Oh, Tasman, like Tasmanian. <laughs> like you are dead. <laughs> no, I know you're not. And you didn't tell me, are you a soccer player? Football. What's your jersey? School, school uniform. <laughs> ah. So is that Tasman School? T S? Turner School. Turner School. Oh, I thought it was yours. Okay, you're not gonna answer. Who knows? Two things. Two questions. <laughs> Question number one, how the heck did we get here? How, did, how in the world, you know, this Earth in all of its grandeur and all those stars and all those planets, and now Kepler told us there's 715 at least Earth-like planets out there in other solar systems and galaxies and stuff. How did that happen? You know, how many of you Anybody ever read the book of Genesis in the Bible? Or, or the first book of the Torah? Or the first book of the Quran? You know, what's it say in the very beginning? In the beginning. And then it makes a guess. It says God. So that's one way, you know. I happen to believe that way, but I also believe in the Big Bang. So how in the world did we get here? Second question. How do we get, how do we get out? No! <laughs> You don't want to get out. Well, I don't, I don't. Second question, though. What's going to Are we alone? Uh, that's, that's question number two. So uh, how in the world did all this stuff happen? And then, are we alone? Those are the two big questions. Now, the questions you all asked are very important questions that we do ask ourselves all the time. And that's what we're asking right now. I showed you the space launch system, the SLS and Orion. We know where we want to go. We know we want to go to Mars. Uh, and we know we have to go safely. The question we ask is, how do we do that? Because between here and Mars is really, really a bad radiation environment. And we know right now that we don't know enough. Will it kill people? Probably not. But uh, how many of you are computer people? And you know what the term single event upset? You know where when we send things to space, sometimes if radiation goes through a computer, it just kind of shocks a microprocessor or something. A computer just quits working. Smart computers today can say, ooh, that hurt. And then it fixes itself. Well, the human brain and the body doesn't do that yet. So we're really worried about a single event upset from high energy particles as you're going between here and Mars. We could get to Mars, the crew could land, and you know, just kind of be like when you come back from flying in space for any period of time. You, you look and you get ready to lift your hand and your hand doesn't respond because it's been out of a gravity environment for a period of time and the neurons just don't work right. That happens just by being away from a gravity environment for a week or two weeks, imagine six months, the way we do on the International Space Station now. So we're worried about, you know, does the brain get a single, couple of single event upsets or what? We need to understand that. So we do have to find out how do we get away from here safely so that we can bring someone back. Uh, so that, did you have a question back there? Back up to that? No? You're gonna, you're gonna answer my question. Yes, right here. If we get, they're going to get, get a mic from you, because, you so people around the world can hear you. Uh, I don't know what it would be webcast. Charles talked about all the satellites. That just shows you for the four areas of science, those are all the satellites that are orbiting this planet. And some of them may even be airplanes, because Earth science, a lot of it's done by airplanes in the atmosphere. But that's, what, that's what's going on. Most of those, we have some international collaboration. As the years roll by, there's going to be more and more junk up there. What's NASA going to do about uh, space junk in the future? Big problem. He's talking about how do you take care of space junk. Uh, the other thing you look at, you know, we have our own rings, just like Saturn, except ours are even more dangerous because ours are in low Earth orbit, right where we like to fly. The International Space Station had to be maneuvered yesterday uh, because there was a large enough piece of debris that the predictions were it's going to come inside a protective bubble 
uh, we don't like things to do. And so, you know, whatever's coming, it's coming. And it's not going to change course. It just doesn't do that. So we had to maneuver the International Space Station. And you don't want to have to do that a lot of times. So we're working collaboratively with other nations. There's a lot of work in Europe uh, looking at how do we clean up low Earth orbit, what we call uh, orbital <coughs> debris. We work on debris mitigation right now. For example, if you build a satellite today, the rule says that satellite has to keep enough fuel on board that it can either deorbit itself to get back into an ocean of the world or boost itself up into an orbit that's way up there where it's, it's not coming back for 100 years or something like that. That's mitigation. We need to clean up, and so it's called active debris removal. We work with the Department of Defense. We work with other, other nations. Nobody has an answer yet. There are a lot of, a lot of thought about, you know, we'll build a spaceship that will go out, you know, like something from Goldfinger or whatever, movie, whatever James Bond movie that was and just gobble it all up, but we're not there yet. Question? Was there a question up there? No? Okay, right there. I'm sorry. Yes, you just said something that absolutely stunned me. But you actually move the ISS. How maneuverable is it? Pretty maneuverable. I mean, it's not like you know you in your car. So, and, and and the thing is, the predictions of uh, close approach are precise enough that we know whether we need to move it feet or tens of feet. We don't move it miles. So we'll move it several meters or you know not even kilometers. I think. But it's just enough such that it increases the mystics. And you know, we'll talk about the asteroid mission in a little while, and it's that will be an example of why we do that. Curiosity, again, I won't dwell on that, uh, except to tell you, like I started out, I watched Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon. You may have seen me in the video, you know, biting my fingers. I mean, I was sweating beads, and, and, and I'm a very emotional person. Uh, I literally cried. There were, there were many of us in the control room. These are really sharp scientists, some of them sitting back here. Uh, that was an emotional moment for us. Uh, I'm a human space flight guy. But let me tell you, watching, and some of, the, some of the imagery you saw from Charles came from onboard Curiosity itself, from its cameras, as it descended to the, to the surface. And everybody was screaming at the end because within minutes, we got video. So we were actually looking at the Martian surface through the eyes of Curiosity. That was incredible. That was this generation's Apollo moon landing, when you stop and think about it. You know, I, I've heard young people, some of our engineers say, you know, I wasn't alive when Apollo appeared. So I really want to see humans on another planet. Uh, some of them say, you know, I, this was the biggest thing that happened in my life. Thousands of people in Times Square in New York. There were literally hundreds of thousands of people around the world. You know, were there as many as there were for the moon landing? I don't know, but there were lots of people who took interest in NASA and what we were doing at least that yeah. one. That yeah. one including later. a number of the guys here. That's right. Who actually worked at Honeysuckle Creek. A lot of people, sorry, I'm an unashamed fan and promoter of them. But a lot of people here in the room probably don't realize that these guys actually tracked the Apollo missions. And when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, at least two or three of them that I can see were there at the controls tracking. Uh, and the first video images came from Honeysuckle Creek. Great. Thank you. Uh, right, okay, right there in the pink. I'm sorry. How do you decide on all of the names for the satellites? How do you decide on all the names of the satellites? That's a great question that I don't know the answer. <laughs> uh, curiosity. We did. A, we had a contest, and it was. Uh, we went out to schools. I was it all over the world or just just in the U.S. All over the world. U.S. US? And a young ninth, she was nine years old at the time, or a ninth grader, maybe. Sarah Ma. Uh, Sarah Ma, you had, they had to write up. Remember today you have to write and express yourselves? Uh, this was a writing contest. Tell us what you think the name of this rover should be and why. And Sarah Ma wrote an, an essay that said it should be named Curiosity for all these reasons. And her primary reason was, it symbolizes what humans are asking themselves all the time. We're incredibly curious. We're going to this planet that we think may, on which life may have once lived or may one day live. Uh, it just it exemplifies our curiosity. So why don't you call it curiosity? So that's how curiosity was named. 
I'm not sure how we name some of the others, but, but we do all kinds of things, okay? Yes, back there. How many Australian astronauts have went to space? Oh, there are three, three who were born in Australia. The one that I know personally is Andy Thomas because he's a very good friend. And I think Andy has been back several times. Andy comes back to appeal to you and your classmates to study extra hard, take a lot of math and science so that you can follow him and be astronauts. Uh, I know two of them have flown in space. Paul Scully Power. Paul Scully Power was one of my teachers, believe it or not. Paul Scully Power taught me oceanography uh, before he became an astronaut. Uh, he flew as a payload specialist on a mission and, and conducted oceanography experiments from space. Uh, so I know Andy and Paul Scully Power. The third one I'm not. Did, okay, okay. So, uh, you know, it's been done, you should be the next, <laughs> okay? Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures. We took this uh, on my second space shuttle mission. We flew higher than anyone's ever flown before in a circular orbit of Earth, uh, not counting those that went to the moon because that's not a circular orbit of Earth. Uh, this was on the space shuttle Discovery back in 1990, and this was the mission where we deployed the Hubble Space Telescope. It gave us an incredible perspective on the planet. If you can see it, you'll notice that there's a very, very thin blue line that kind of between that blackness of space and the color of Earth, that's our atmosphere. That is it. So just repeat what we do on orbit. Close one eye, take your thumb, and stick it up there and see what happens to the atmosphere. Uh, that changes your whole perspective about this planet when you look at it in that, that sense. The other thing that it did for me, everybody probably recognizes that part of the world. If you don't, um, it's the Middle East. And it is an area of the world that it just seems to be in turmoil all the time, where we don't seem to be able to get it right. From that vantage point, hopefully you see it the same way I do, it is absolutely incredible. It is so beautiful. Uh, the greens, and it's mostly desert, but every once in a while, there's a lot of greens where there's agriculture and stuff and it is all so colorful and beautiful. And you look at it and you say, if that's the way that God intended it for it to be, what in the world are we doing wrong? Why can't we get it right? So, you know, you look at it, you look at the earth from that perspective, and you come back and you say, I'm gonna do something. You know, I'm really gonna try to make a difference. Uh, we reach out to all nations. Uh, everywhere to try to get them interested in, in doing things to make this planet better. Everything that we do at NASA is trying to make life better here on Earth. Even when we're exploring other planets, we're trying to figure out what do they tell us, what does their life and existence tell us about our own home planet Earth? Uh, why is Mars the way it is? Why is Venus the way it is? Did somebody or something do something somewhere along the line that caused them to be uninhabitable? So we've got to learn. The other thing I'll tell you is I am always looking for other things, not other people, because I don't know what other life looks like. You know, life can come in all kinds of forms, amoeba. Uh, you know, you've got these single cell things. That's life. That may be what we find on Mars. Uh, but if we find any form of life whatsoever, that is incredibly dramatic. The message that that gives to us about our world, about our universe, is dramatically different when we know that there is other life elsewhere in this universe. So I would caution everybody, don't expect that your first alien you encounter is gonna look like you. It may not, but don't wanna kill it just because it doesn't look like us. You know, it may be much more intelligent than we are. We just have to, we have to adapt to whatever we find. I'm certain that life on Mars, when we do that, it'll be a little bit different than, than life down here. You know, you may live underground because the environment dictates that, but that's, that's my favorite image. Uh, some other things real quick. Uh, that's some of the stuff that we're doing nowadays back there. Another question. So just quickly, what's your position on men are from Mars, women are from Venus? Uh, <laughs> I don't have a position. <laughs> Because I, I don't have it. That's probably the safest thing to do. How about you? What do you think? Oh, I think my kids are from another planet a lot of the time. <laughs> no, I was just wondering about the, the 
the man and the woman in the tin can going around. Yeah. I really want to know the results from that. That's well, you know, we've had that. men and women in tin cans. We've not done any, any, any experimentation about men and women in tin cans, but three of my crews, uh, my very first flight was all male. And then after that, I didn't fly any flights that didn't have women as a member of the crew. I flew with Kathy Sullivan twice. My last flight, uh, I had Dr. Jan Davis. Um, hopefully, they thought I was an incredible crew member because I knew they were. Uh, so, it, it, you know, you're really focused on the mission. Um, we live and work in space today for six months uh, at a time. We're getting ready to send Scott Kelly and a Russian colleague up in the next year, and they're going to be there for a year. Uh, it's not the longest humans have ever lived in space. We've been in space for, uh, I want to say, 477 days. The, the Soviets did it way back a long time ago because they've always been thinking, as we have, about can we live on Mars? And so that was sort of a, sort of a let's see how long humans can do that. No mission should be unwomaned. Unwomaned? <laughs> well, that's why I say un... un I, I said, what did I say? <laughs> what did I say, Rudy? Uncrewed. I try to... I am a man in a woman's world. I am married to the most wonderful woman in the world. I do have a son, but I have a daughter who is absolutely incredible. She's a plastic surgeon. I have three granddaughters, and they're, they're American Australian because their mother is from, is from Sydney, and they are dynamic. Uh, they're very smart, very athletic. They love to dance, and so we keep telling them, you know, you gotta decide, okay, what are you gonna do? You can't do everything all the time. Right now, they're young enough that they think they can do everything. Well, you say when they're going to get a proper job. Uh, uh, I'm not going to challenge them that way. I, this is just a really quick, quick picture of the number of ways that NASA is engaged in international partnerships, partnerships with other agencies, looking at how we can do technology development. So now, if, if you have questions that you want to ask in a formal setting, right there. Firstly, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to us. It's been awesome. Um, you touched on kids um, working hard, all that sort of thing. When they're very into the science, because there's so many fascinating things to do, um, best to follow your passion? Is that the best? Ah, you, I couldn't have said it better. I tell people all the Did everybody hear what she said? What's your name there, young lady? Ah, uh, you forgot! <laughs> you forgot! Jessica, did you hear what she said? What did she say? It's important, really important. Say it again for Jessica. What did you ask me? But you, it was a statement. Kind of. It's important to follow your passion. She said, follow your passion. You know what passion is? You know, it's something that really just, just it's burning in you. Uh, I tell people all the time, follow your passion. You cannot go wrong if you follow your passion. Your mother and father love you. They can't tell you what to do when you grow up. You know, they're gonna want you to be a scientist or an engineer, and that may not be where your heart is. You may be the most brilliant person in a long time, get a PhD in physics and decide that you want to dance. And if that's where your passion is, you should do that, and you will be incredibly good. And you can teach people the physics of dance. <laughs> because everything we do is science, everything we do is science and math. We have some professional athletes today that work with us because they'll go out and football is big in the United States, not your football, but football, football. And <laughs> <laughs> that come out. <laughs> Aussie rules football is different than football. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay, I'm not, I'm not, you, you, you like Aussie rules football? You like football. Do you? No? Yes. We're talking about that little wimpy American football, you know, where they take that, that ball that looks sort of like a rugby thing, sort of like an Aussie rules football thing, but it's, it's a little thinner, and, and, and people throw it all the time. And uh, there's a, a guy by the name of Kurt Warner, who was an all-pro quarterback. I mean, went to the Super Bowl many times, uh, was incredibly accurate. Uh, you got to think about it now. If you're a quarterback, how many people follow, follow American football? You know, you got this quarterback who's back there, and people are coming at him and everything, and there's a receiver kind of darting across the field. And he throws the ball, and boom, it goes right into the receiver's hand. How in the world does he do that? And so Kurt Warner does a little 30-second thing for us where he talks about the physics of football. The first thing you got to do, you got to get it spinning so it's stable. When we pop a satellite out of the shuttle back in the old days, we spun it to stabilize it, and it came out. 
and it just rolls nice and easy up out of the shelf. If we hadn't spun it, it might come out and start doing like this, wobbling and stuff. So, so it's, we call it spin stabilizing, spin stabilization. Kurt Warner said, first thing, try to, try to make sure that your ball's spinning. A lot of quarterbacks throw wobbly passes and they get there, but, but Kurt Warner said, get good spin on it, it's gonna be stable. The other thing is, remember what you learned in school, he says, because it's all geometry. Mm -hmm. And he says, you know, that person is there, the angle is gonna be about like this, I'm estimating that speed. If I want to throw the ball so they catch it, they're going to be about there when I let it go from my hand. So throw it there. Don't throw it where they are. If you shoot a rifle, anybody hunt ducks or geese or quail or stuff like that? Any, any hunters? I don't. I can't shoot. Uh, but a hunter, really good. You know, you've got a goose flying overhead. You shoot, aim where the goose is, never hit it because the goose is gone. When the, when the shot gets there. So you got to know a little geometry. There is math in every single thing we do. There's science in every single thing you do. Are you a ballerina? You're an ice skater? Anybody an ice skater? <laughs> Come on, help me here, help me, help me. You're an ice skater. Well, you don't have to be an ice skater. You can help me here. You watch the Olympics? The Winter Olympics? You know, what do you, you know, when the, oh, the really good uh, ice skaters, they, they do this, whatever you call the spin thing. Yeah. Uh, if they want to go fast, what do they do? Pull their arms in. If they want to go slow, what do they do? They come out of it, sometimes put their arms out and they slow down. So you got a lot of mass out here that doesn't let you turn as fast. That's science and physics and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, you got to know some science and math and all that. So, Listen to mom and dad, but follow your passion. <laughs> Is there another one? Where's the mic? Uh, this one's just here. Right there. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. Is, uh, is it possible to go back to the curiosity photo and just describe some of the equipment that's hanging off it? Oh, curiosity. As Charles said, I, I don't want to tell you the number. I think there are like 10 chemistry sets on it or something like that. Uh, one that fascinates me, you know the mass that sits? Oh, why am I doing this? Let's do this. You see this thing that has the camera on top? That's called a mask. That was built by the Spanish. It was built in the, in the Spanish Astrobiology Center outside of Madrid, Spain. That is Curiosity's weather station. So Curiosity sends us the weather on Mars every single day, uh, kind of all day long. You can see some little appendages sticking out. Those are anemometers. They measure wind if there were wind. I don't know whether there is wind on Mars. Probably not. But I don't know. Uh, but they, they give temperature, all kinds of stuff. Uh, the arm itself, it has a drill, and it can go like, like that, or it can go like that. If you look at the camera up on the top of the, the mast, uh, one of the things in there is a laser. And the laser goes, and it hits a rock and vaporizes the rock. And then that same laser is looking at it feeding it back into Curiosity, and it does a real quick spectral analysis that says, ah, there's oxygen, hydrogen, iron, other kinds of stuff in the rock. So those are just some. Every once in a while, we'll take a sample when we drill, and we'll, it'll get, it'll get sucked up. It gets drawn up into the, into the drill bit, and then it puts it you know, in one of these chemistry labs, and it goes all down, and it heats up, and they do another spectral analysis. So lots of stuff like that. The Russians have something called DAN that's a radiation monitor. And we actually use that all the way from Earth to Mars to help us get an idea of what's the radiation environment like between here and Mars. It measures radiation on the surface of Mars. The Brits have uh, it, 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 a lot of different things. OK, hopefully so, I give you an idea. So basically, it sounds as though you put a death ray on Mars. <laughs> uh, no, it's not a death ray. It's, but it is a laser. And uh, it does have energy, and it zaps yeah. rock. Right. Yes? Um, firstly, I'd just like to reiterate, thanks for such a fantastic presentation. Um, I had a quick question regarding the SLS. Yes. Um, I guess given today's political and economic climate, how difficult was it to essentially choose a, an amped up Saturn V rocket, oh. which we know to be particularly wasteful, and did the emergence of uh, like SpaceX and the Falcon 9 and things like that kind of cut your deadlines? But I would contend that you're wrong about one thing. 
Saturn wasn't particularly wasteful, particularly expensive, yes. And SLS is particularly expensive in, in relative terms. Uh, in terms of usefulness, as Charles said, one of the things we're looking at right now for SLS that we weren't thinking about when we chose that form of, of launch vehicle was using it for planetary science. That, that's something that has come about recently because when you talk about going to Europa, um, you know, you really don't want to have to spend seven, eight years in transit like we're doing with Juno right now. We have a, a mission on the way to Jupiter called Juno. Juno's going to get to Jupiter after five years of transit. Uh, you know, we launched it when I became the NASA administrator, and it'll get there just as I'm leaving as the NASA administrator. That's a long time. And it's time for scientists who are going to be involved in the investigations once it gets to the planet, uh, but between now and then they're prepping whereas they could, be doing, they could be doing investigation if we can get it there, say, four years earlier. We think we can, with SLS, we think we can get uh, a mission to Europa in about two, two and a half years, as opposed to six and a half years it'll take with, with a standard rocket today, whether it's a Falcon Heavy or an Atlas V or whatever. Uh, we needed something. There are, let, let me put it this way. There are thousands of configurations of launch vehicles that you could pick. Uh, we have been looking at launch vehicles for different missions for decades. And every time we do a study, the answers come out about the same. Okay, you can do any one of these thousand ways. There are literally thousands of things, paths, you could take on the way to Mars. We chose the asteroid redirect mission. Why? Why not go back to the surface of the moon? Well, it's because technologically, we don't need to do anything new uh, to get back to the surface of the moon. To capture an asteroid, to redirect an asteroid, uh, a lot of stuff we don't know yet. We theorize that we can use solar electric propulsion, same thing that drives dawn, amp it up, you know, get bigger solar arrays or more powerful solar arrays. If we can get 50 kilowatts or something like that compared to two or five that we fly typically today, uh, the thing is it thrusts continually. Um, what's your name? Would you do me a favor? You told me your name before, so I did. Would you do me a favor? You trust me? Come on. <laughs> You're my asteroid, okay? What's your name? Elia. Elia. Wow, that's beautiful. Elia's my asteroid. Bear with me, okay? Elia, start walking toward me slowly. This is the way asteroids do today. This is an asteroid coming toward Earth. This is what I can do today. Nothing. So if the asteroid's big enough, Elia gets through my atmosphere and Chelly Binks in Russia, a little bit more than a year ago, February a year ago, Elliot got through the atmosphere and <laughs> exploded over the Russian town of Chelyabinsk. Uh, 1,500 people were injured, broke windows, damaged places, and all that. Now, and start over, okay? Elliot's coming toward me. Now, I am going to launch an unmanned vehicle, uncrewed vehicle, and I'm going to go up here and I'm going to just put my arms around Elliot. She's still coming toward her. But now I've got some little rocket engines and I'm gonna start thrusting. And I'm gonna do that for about a year, year and a half. What's happening to Elia's path? It's changing. Now, go back to your math and science. Elia, you probably know this. If I get this thing like way out there and I move it by an arc second, how much does it miss? I don't know the answer to this. Don't worry, don't worry. But trust me, some of these smart guys in here, they can tell you. If we intercept it early enough and we move it by an arc second, an arc second is tiny, really, really tiny. How much? I mean, but, but, it, but it, it misses Earth by a big amount. The farther out I get it. If, it, if I wait until late, then I'm going to push. But, you know, in a year and a half, you can really move it. That's what we believe, Elia, and you're going to help us do that. But that's what's really, thank you very much. You're a great expert. But that's, the, that's essentially the asteroid redirect mission, the, the robotic part of it. Now, what happens as it gets closer and closer to the moon? What is, what, everybody has gravity. Gravity is the bigger, at least the way I learned in school. I, think I, have to look, I have to keep looking at my guys up here from JPL. They're the real scientists. And every once in a while, somebody will go. <laughs> so, so far, they haven't done that too much. But I learned in school, big bodies like Jupiter, Saturn, huge gravity. 
relative to Earth. The moon, smaller. Mars, smaller. So, you know, a sixth on the moon. I forget what it is on Mars, but about that. Um, if I can direct that asteroid, just get it ever so close to the moon, then what happens? Asteroids orbit the sun. So that's the gravitational field that affects most asteroids. And that's what makes it, most of them orbit between Mars and other planets out there. So they never threaten Earth. Every once in a while, one goes in one of these oblong, odd, egg-shaped orbits, and it dips across Mars' as an orbit. It dips across Earth's orbit. Those are the ones we worry about because it's still gonna go around the sun eventually, like one not very many months ago that we were really hoping would come out the other side, we were watching it, and, and it got too close to the sun and it just didn't come out. Um, those are the ones we worry about. But if we get it ever so close to the moon, the moon's gravity, although it's much smaller than the sun's, it exceeds the sun's gravity at that point, and all of a sudden, the asteroid starts to enter lunar orbit. That's the way we went when we sent Apollo to the moon. It got to a certain point where the, the Earth's gravity, which is much bigger than the moon's, but it got far enough away that Earth's gravity became less of an effect on, set on the Apollo module, and all of a sudden it got drawn in by the moon and it went into the lunar orbit. We slowed it down a little bit so as to make sure that it got grabbed. And that's the way we come back to Earth. When we, when we fly around Earth, like on the International Space Station and things, and a crew comes back, uh, we launch from there, they're doing 17,500 miles an hour. We turn around backwards, shh, it burns a little bit, it slows down. Just enough that gravity takes a hold of it again and draws it back into Earth and pop, eventually we hit Earth. We do it on purpose, okay? So that's kind of what happens. It, one more question, yes. Um, hi, my name's Helen and I'm a science teacher. And Yay! <laughs> Thank we you. We need people like you out there you are telling everybody how exciting science and math is. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Not really a question, but um, were, were there any particular teachers in your education along the way that um, inspired you to choose four teachers? My mom. Can you talk about that? My dad. I was my mother's library assistant in junior <laughs> high school. Uh, so I back then we used to pack books. You know, we got out in the summer, and so. The librarians used to wrap books in newspaper and put them back on the shelf to keep the dust from getting on them. So I used to wrap books. My dad, I never was in his class, in a classroom, but I was in his class on the football field. Uh, so I, I was incredibly lucky. I had the best football coach that anybody could have uh, and the best dad that anybody could have. So I learned two different, totally different things from my father. You know, I learned how to compete. I also learned how to cry from him. I hear that a lot. Um, he taught me that, you know, men can cry, uh, men can have emotions, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and then the two other teachers, uh, Mr. Jeff Cope, my junior high school math teacher, uh, kind of taught us new math, uh, set theory is what it, what, it, what it was called back then. Uh, and they didn't teach that in school, but he had, he had gone to a teacher's summer conference and learned it and said, hey, if anybody wants to come and learn what I learned last summer, I'd be glad to do it. We can do it at recess or we can do it after school. And so I was one of those, and I just became fascinated by that. And then probably the, the number one person was James P. Neal. Uh, he was my, my junior high school science teacher in seventh grade. Got me interested in science fairs, and I did one science fair, and, and I never looked back. I did science fair every single year after that because I was just mesmerized by being able to put my hands into something and do an experiment and then talk about it and show stuff. So teachers had a profound impact on, on my life. And, I think, you know, we don't choose to be role models. Everybody's a role model. We don't, I, I've heard, Charles Barkley is a former professional basketball player in the United States and doing an interview one time, somebody asked him about being a role model. He said, I'm not a role model, I don't want to be one. I just like being a bad guy. And, uh, you know, and, the, and the, the interviewer said, but Charles, you are a role model. You're a bad role model. <laughs> kids, kids look at every single thing we do. Uh, you know this as a teacher. Um, when I left high school to go to the United States Naval Academy, that's all I wanted to do from seventh grade on. I went there and I hated it. I, I mean, I was really, it was hard. Much harder than I thought it was going to be. And I'd call home and I'd tell my mom and dad I want to come home. I made a mistake. I made a really bad mistake. And my father, in his infinite wisdom, would tell me, stay there one more week. Just hang in there one more week. 52 weeks. <laughs> I, I hung in there one more week. And I got through for the year. 
uh, when my son went to the Naval Academy 25 years later, and he hated it, in spite of the fact that I tried to tell him that, I didn't have the heart to tell him to hang in there one more week. <laughs> so I had to think of something new, so I said, look, there are classmates of yours who are having just as difficult a time as you are, if not harder. When you hang the phone up, go back to the company area, find one of them who's really struggling, and get them through the next day. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he did that. And to this day, he's, he's now been in the, in the Marine Corps for 20 years. And when I meet his classmates, the one thing that every single one of them says was, you know, Che got me through school. Mm -hmm. Because he took time one day to let them know that you can do this. So I'll close with, with, with a lesson, and it's a, it's a human lesson. NASA has always looked at as a technical organization, and we are. We do absolutely incredible stuff. I love to tell people, we take science fiction and turn it into science fact. Mm -hmm. We take the impossible and make it seem possible. Uh, curiosity was impossible. A ask any of these guys at, at JPL, from the very beginning, they were told, in fact, first time they presented it to my predecessor, Mike Griffin, uh, he threw him out of the office. And I asked Mike, he said, well, I didn't throw him out. He said, I just told him, go back and do some more work. That, that, that concept is just doesn't make sense. You know, lowering, sending something all the way to Mars, and then lowering it to the surface of Mars on a, on a cable, that's the best we can do? <laughs> that is the best that NASA can do? How about something revolutionary? I mean, you know, we lower stuff, we lower boats into the water on a cable. And they came back and they presented it to him, explained it a little bit better, and he said, hey, let's try it. We, didn't, we weren't sure we could get through the Martian atmosphere. It's, it's very thin. We don't know a lot about it. We know much more now than we did, but still not enough. Uh, we've got to learn a lot more about the Martian atmosphere before we start talking about sending humans, because there, you've got a big vehicle. Curiosity weighed 2,000 pounds, you know, a metric ton. Um, when we send humans, they're going to be a big vehicle. And we don't know whether the Martian atmosphere, whether we can have a parachute or something else that'll decelerate the vehicle enough that it doesn't go just smack into the Martian surface. So we've got to learn some more about that. Um, but with all that, we are 17,000 civil servants and about 40,000 contractors who are people, every single one of us. And we have feelings, we have emotions, we have all that stuff. And we really need to learn how to take care of each other. And we talk about it all the time. We spend a lot of time worrying about the people, not worrying, thinking about the people things. I talked in the beginning about the importance of diversity and inclusion. Diversity means just trying to make sure that you're a group. If you want good ideas, put together some people that don't agree on anything. <laughs> and that have incredibly different backgrounds from different parts of the country. Maybe not even speak the same language, because what we want is competition of ideas. And then when you decide what the best idea is, you can follow that, and you can make anything work. But you've got to have competition of ideas to get the best idea. The inclusion part just means listen to everybody. Uh, frequently, especially with women, I, I can go to one of my centers and I ask, okay, and I can talk to an engineer, a female engineer. I said, okay, how many of you have been in a meeting? I'll get to it. How many of you have been in a meeting and somebody asks an idea and you give your idea and every, all the men sitting around the table say, yeah, OK. And then they go around, and about two people later, it's a man who says exactly what you said. And everybody goes, wow, yeah, man, why didn't we think of that? It happens every single day. Uh, you know, for those of you who, who, for men, ask your wife, ask your daughter, ask, uh, ask somebody, how often does that happen? Uh, and that's because we are not inclusive. We aren't willing to accept everybody's input to listen to it. So that's really important. The, the lesson I'll leave you with is, uh, and I will get to your question. Uh, don't have time. Uh, the saying, the quote that I, that I put up there, it's, this is a true story uh, it, told by an American writer by the name of Jim Wooten, who heard about a young, young boy in, in Africa. His name was, was Nikosi Johnson. And if you Google, if you go to the you go online and you just, just put Nikosi Johnson in, or we are all the same. Uh, you'll get information about a book that Jim Wooten wrote about this, this young African boy. He was born with AIDS because his mother had AIDS, and she knew she was going to die shortly after he was born. So in her village in KwaZulu Natal, South Africa, she found a, a friend, a young white woman by the name of Gail Johnson. And she said, Gail, would, 
when I die, would you take Nkosi and raise him? You know, and Gil promised to do that. And so he was born several weeks or months later. His mother died. And Gil began to raise Nkosi. And Gil Johnson and other people who knew him said he was not a normal kid. Uh, he was racked with sores and everything because he, he, the AIDS hit him right away. But said he was always positive, always had a smile on his face, always talking about we need to do this, we need to do that, always for other people, not about him. Never cried out in pain, never asked for anything. They traveled all over South Africa, traveled all over the continent of Africa, traveled all around the world crusading to find a cure for AIDS. Uh, and, and now there's a place in Cape Town called Nicosi's Haven that's sort of his legacy where they try to work with kids who, who have AIDS. But when Jim Wooten heard about him, he went, uh, he got a call from a friend of his after he met him the first time and said, hey, Nicosi's in pretty bad shape. He's, he's getting ready to die. And so if you want to see him, you better hustle back. So Jim Wooten got in an airplane, flew from the United States back to South Africa, went into the hospital and he said he sat at Nicosi's bedside Nikosi was 12 years old, man, and he weighed about 20 pounds. And he was there just skin and bones, uh, this black skin all full of sores and pus and everything, but a big smile on his face, these beautiful white teeth shining through the smile. And, and he was telling people, we need to do this, we need to do that. And Jim Wooten said, stop. Nikosi, just stop. You're going to die. And he said, Nikosi looked. Nikosi looked at him and he said, yeah. He said, but Nikosi, you could die today. He said, yep. He said, well, I don't get it. You know, I am told you never asked for anything. You never cried out in pain. All you're doing is trying to help other people. What in the world? What gives? And he said, Nikosi looked up at him and smiled. He said, do all you can with what you have and the time that you have and the place that you are. Best message I can leave to the kids. You know, this is your world. The things we do today in NASA, not for me because I'm probably not going to be around for a lot of uh, things that happen out in, you know, in, at Tinbin Bella and other places. We're doing that for, for the future. And so all of us should do what we can with what we have in the time that we have in the place that we are, whether that's here in Canberra or, or somewhere else. So with that, uh, I will leave you and say thank you so very much, and I'll come up there and answer your questions. <laughs>